Good morning. Committee will come to order. Thank you all for joining us this morning, and a special thanks to all the witnesses for coming in. Uh, I want to get it uh, kicked off uh, at the appointed time, and uh, we'll have uh, probably some other members come and go as we proceed here, so we appreciate your time. Uh, one of the keys to long-term growth in our economy is to create an environment that encourages innovation. Uh, we know that when given the opportunity, it's small firms that have proven they can lead the way innovating and creating new jobs in America. Uh, many innovations and in businesses that we benefit from today found their start in basements and garages around the country. From 2000 to 2017, small businesses created 8.4 million new jobs, or nearly two-thirds of all the new jobs created in the U.S. In my own district in Colorado, 93% of employer businesses are small, and many of those are professional, scientific, and technical services. One of the ways we have spurred innovation is through targeted and smart federal investments in research and development. Since the 1980s, the SBA has led the SBIR STTR program, also known as America's Seed Fund, to invest in research and development of cutting edge technology. The SBIR STTR program is funded through a federal uh, set aside of extramural research and development funding spanning 11 federal agencies. Each agency offers direct grants to science and tech entrepreneurs to help bring their technology to the market under the direction of the SBA's policy directive. Over the last three decades, the SBIR program has boasted significant return on investment and has generated billions in tax revenue. A study of the Navy and Air Force programs show that the $6.25 billion in SBIR funding generated $8.8 .8 billion in new tax revenue and $92.1 billion in overall economic impact. Despite the success of the program, uh, these programs set aside has only been incrementally increased to 3.2% as a part of the 2011 reauthorization over the last six years. Since then, our global competitors like China have aggressively invested in research and development. When SBIR, STTR was first implemented in 1982, the U.S. was at a crossroads, crossroads much like we are today, and in danger of losing its leadership in innovation due to globalization. More than 30 years later, due to stagnant investments in research and development, the U.S. is once again at risk of falling behind. Due to short-term cost-cutting and failure to accelerate the infusion of federal funds, other countries are swiftly catching up to the U.S. For example, China has drastically diminished the U.S. lead in innovation as they have aggressively invested in research and development, while the U.S. investment as a percentage of GDP has actually dropped. The SBIR STTR program plays a critical role in maintaining the U.S. dominance in innovation. U.S. technology has maintained a lead because of significant success in information and communications technology. The computer, microchip, and internet were all achieved through partnerships between government, academia, and entrepreneurs. The first computers were funded by the military and commercialized through the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard. Similarly, Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin used federal funding to research and then develop a prototype of today's Google search. And significantly, Qualcomm developed the microchip that changed the global face of wireless communications using grants from these programs. The company now holds more than 13,000 patents, has over 35,000 employees worldwide, and is valued at nearly $100 billion. Like the SBIR STTR program, the SBA's Growth Accelerator Competition Fund is changing how innovation is funded in America. Over the last five years, the competition has funded over 223 projects in 45 states. The competition also has had significant success reaching diverse applicants, awarding 44% of the awards to women, 41% to underserved communities, and 16% to rural communities. However, the SBA and participating agencies can do more to foster innovation and help the U.S. maintain its global leadership. In the past few months, I've spoken with researchers and small business owners who have shared their experiences with SBIR, STTR. They point to what their industry calls the valley of death, where innovative ideas that don't get timely or appropriately funded can't move forward. In order to remain competitive in innovation with the rest of the world, 
there is significant need to reduce process burdens and streamline the application process. We will use today's hearing to not only discuss the benefits of the program, but also consider where they can be improved. We will also highlight ideas like the Air Force's pitch day model, which awarded uh, a business in my district with a SBIR phase one award to small business innovation vouchers for commercialization and technical assistance programs. I hope that today's discussion will shed light on the many benefits of these programs, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to improve the SBI's ability to accelerate innovation and maintain U.S. competitiveness. I thank each of the witnesses for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. I would now like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Balderson, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to all of you in the panel, and thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy day and uh, to come forward to us today. Um, I know it's, it's, it's challenging sometimes. So innovation is the engine that drives our country's success. Our economy's foundation is built on technology, breakthroughs that find state-of-the-art solutions to difficult problems, then capitalizing on those products specifically through entrepreneurship. This coalition is particularly important for our small businesses. Small, fin small firms tend to be nimbler, more responsive to market changes, and more rapidly than bigger counterparts in driving innovation to make the USA leader in the world economy. In this modern era of globalization, it is essential for both America's competitiveness and national security that small businesses are easily able to develop and commercialize their innovative products. This is why programs like the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Programs are so important. Small technology-based firms tend to be highly incentive, constantly pioneering new advancements. The federal government should encourage this innovation. Binding these newly developed technologies with other federal R&D efforts was seen as a natural extension both to boost small business participation in federal activities and to solve agency institutional problems, be they at the Department of Defense, National Institute of Health, or the Department of Energy. All too often, good, good ideas never materialize. This could be due to lack of funding, lack of public understanding, or perceived lack of marketplace for revolutionary technology. The SBIR and the STTR programs bridge the gap between this and practical building our economy and improving the function of the federal government in the process. Similar to the strategy that brought about the SBIR and STTR programs, the SBA's Growth Accelerator Fund competition was designed to support small business job creation by giving early stage entrepreneurs opportunities to immerse themselves in intense learning. Accelerators can provide founders of early stage companies with education, mentorship, financing, cohort-based cohort training, and technical assistance. In the SBA program, accelerators, incubators, co-working startup companies, and other entrepreneur models compete for grants of $50,000 each. In 2019, the competition focused on accelerators that work with high-tech entrepreneurs who are potential SBIR or STTR program applicants. The applicants must focus most of their efforts in support of entrepreneurs in the following groups. Opportunity zones, socially and economically disadvantaged, women-owned businesses, or entrepreneurs located in states and territories that are traditionally underrepresented in the programs. Taken together, these programs aim to increase the number of small businesses in the high-tech segment of our economy, as well as raise their presence in federal <laughs> research and development efforts. That's a win-win for both the private and public sectors by creating jobs, growing companies, and providing solutions to complex problems. Again, I thank all of you for being with us this morning. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Balderson. The gentleman yields back. Uh, and if committee members have an opening statement prepared, we would ask that they be submitted for the record. I would like to take just a minute now to explain the timing rules. Each witness gets five minutes to testify, and the members get five minutes for questioning. There's a lighting system to assist you. The green light will be on when you begin, and then the yellow light comes on when you have one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you're out of time, and we ask that you stay within that time frame to the best of your ability. Our first witness, Dr. Allison Brown, who hails from Colorado Springs in my home state of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Brown is the president and CEO of NABSIS Corporation, a GPS technology company and SBIR awardee. She has over 15 years of experience in GPS receiver design and holds eight GPS-related patents. 
She is currently a member of the U.S. Air Force Scientific Advisory Board and served as a space representative for the Institute of Navigation Council in 1993. Dr. Brown is a member of the editorial board for GPS World and received the SBIR Tibbetts Award for her excellence in the program. She received her BA and MA from engineering from Cambridge University, England, and earned an SM in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. That kind of makes my brain hurt, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Where she was awarded the DuPont Scholarship and studied as a Draper Fellow. She also has a PhD in mechanics and aerospace from UCLA. Welcome, Dr. Brown. Our second wis uh, witness is Mr. Rohit uh, Shuk uh, Shukla, the CEO of LARTA Institute an internationally recognized technology accelerator. In founding and growing LARTA Institute, he has developed a reputation and expertise in the commercialization of innovations emerging from government-funded initiatives, research institutes, universities, and larger companies in the private sector. Mr. Shukla has a master's degree in social and political sciences from Cambridge University, England, and a master's degree in communications, arts, and sciences from Loyola Marymount University, Los Angeles. Welcome, Mr. Shukla. Our third witness is Mr. Javier Sade. Mr. Sade is a managing partner and venture partner at Impact Master Holdings and Fenway Summer Ventures. He was one of the highest ranking Latino appointees in President Obama's administration, where he served as associate administrator of the Small Business Administration. In that role, Mr. Sade oversaw the Small Business Investment Company, Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer uh, System, that both the programs we're talking about today and growth accelerator fund programs, which collectively and since inception have invested over $120 billion in 320,000 small companies. Mr. Sade holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, an MS in Operations and Technology from Illinois Institute of Technology, and a BS in Industrial Management and Manufacturing Engineering from Purdue University. Welcome, Mr. Sade. I would now like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Balder Balderson, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our Friday witness today is Mr. Ron Schroeder, Chief Executive Officer and President of Frontier Technology Incorporated, or FTI, in Beaver Creek, Ohio. Mr. Schroeder has nearly 40 years of diversified technical and management experience in the Department of Defense, commercial, and other federal markets. During his tenure, FTI was awarded the SBA Tibbetts Award for the best, the very best in federal innovation research. He has been a member of the Governor's Ohio Aerospace and Aviation Technology Committee. Thank you for serving on that committee, great committee. And is the formal national president for the Defense Planning and Analysis Society. Thank you for being with us today, Mr. Schroeder. Uh, always good to have a great Ohio one here. Thank you very much, Mr. Balderson. Welcome, Mr. Schroeder. Uh, Dr. Brown, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Crow, Mr. Balderson and members of the committee. I'm very honored to be here today talking to you about the Small Business Innovative Research Program and what a huge advantage that has been to my company and others in the state of Colorado. My name is Allison Brown. Um, NASA's corporation is a small business located in Monument, Colorado. And we've been developing innovative positioning, navigation and timing solutions for the government and private sector since 1986. Much of our success has been from the technology that we developed with funding through the SBIR program. As an example, um, we developed an early device for use on Air Force radio sons with an SBIR contract, and that transitioned into the very first deployed emergency 911 system in Colorado. Um, and the phone that we developed using that technology is actually now on display at the Smithsonian Aerospace Museum. Throughout my company's history, we've only been able to bring innovations to the warfighter and field these solutions rapidly because of the SBIR program. However, we, like many other small businesses, have faced challenges, uh, in particular in SBIR transitions, both in protecting our intellectual property and also in obtaining phase three contracts with the Department of Defense. The <clears throat> Excuse me. To date, most of the protect protections enacted by Congress already to improve the SBIR process have not yet been implemented in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations. Um, today we have updates from to the SBIR Policy Directive that include the, this legislation that has been released by the Small Business Administration. 
but the SBA is not staffed to enforce their own policy, and small businesses continue to face challenges due to the lack of defense acquisition regulations which implement this SBIR legislative language. Government industry panels established under the National Defense um, Authorization Act of 2016, the Section 809 and 813 panels, they've both recognized the importance of SBIR in defense acquisitions. The Section 809 panel on acquisition reform recognized um, and recommended that the um, SBIR program both be made um, permanent and also that the uh, SBIR allocation should be doubled um, increased from 3.2% uh, currently to um, 7%. I personally served on the Section 813 panel, which was uh, chartered to uh, look at improvements to technical data rights, and that resulted in recommending that SBR data rights should be afforded similar protection within defense acquisition regulations as commercially developed items. The argument for this was that the intent of SBR data rights is to reward small businesses for their innovation and invention, and they need that protection. The SBR program remains today one of the few successful paths for, for small businesses to bring innovations into the hands of the warfighter. Recently, Dr. Will Roper, who is the Assistant Secretary of Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, initiate a new SBIR pitch day model as a faster, smarter approach to compete for ideas that can solve near-term problems for the Air Force. NASIS has won two pitch day SBIR awards to date. In the first um, pitch day, contracting officials reviewed 417 submissions. They, um, they invited 59 businesses to pitch their proposals in person in New York last March. I was there. It took only 15 minutes for me to make my pitch to a panel of Air Force program executives, and literally 10 minutes later, I had received the Phase One contract award. We expect to receive our Phase Two contract later this month, which is less than eight months after submission of our first proposal. The SBR program provides the mechanism to bring innovative companies into the DOD ecosystem. Dr. Roper said the next challenge is to organize to do this type of activity at scale. So I'd ask you to consider first mandating that DOD promptly updates the DFARS to align with the SBIR policy directive, to adopt the recommendations from the Section 809 and the 813 panels, and to increase funding to facilitate rapid transition of SBR developed technology under programs such as the Air Force Pitch Days. And just to close, in General Stephen Wilson's own words, allow us, us as small businesses to deliver speed of capability to the battlefield. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Shukla, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Crow, Ranking Member Borders, and members of the committee, thank you so much for inviting me to speak before you today. It is a privilege to bear witness to the greatness of the SPR STTR program, and I just want to add here that we also were a recipient of the SPR Tibbetts Award. I just want to make sure that everybody recognizes that. Um, uh, thank you. Um, for over 17 years, LADA has been providing commercialization services to SBIR and STTR grantees at several agencies, civilian agencies. Uh, NIH, uh, NIST, USDA, NOAA, and DOE being the most, the, the most recent one, covering our mission as an organization to focus on solutions that feed, fuel, and heal the world. We have worked closely with some 4,000 SBR, SDTR grantees since 2004. One size does not fit all, and I'll come back to that in a second, in a minute here. Companies in the SBR program, the ones that we've certainly been involved with over the last 17 years, are at different stages of maturity, development, uh, different mindsets, objectives, assets, and histories. So we've developed a network-centric uh, model of assistance to serve this diversity, one that customizes the experience of commercialization to meet the grantees' needs and objectives, realities of the marketplace one that uses the wisdom, experience, and networks of a host of domain experts, functional professionals, and industry buyers and investors to focus grantees on their best and highest prospects in a highly dynamic and competitive marketplace. To be clear, we are what you might consider a virtual accelerator. 
This approach has been very successful. Our portfolio companies have raised over $2 billion. There have been 50 acquisitions, 10 IPOs, and as important, the vast majority of companies that we've served are still around and doing reasonably well, beating the odds on survival of small businesses, which you all know about. Providing these innovators with the tools to navigate a competitive marketplace and then having them be a part of our evolving and powerful network has drawn attention to the success of what is now known as ecosystem services approach. Um, we've perfected this over a long period of time. The emergence of TABA, which you are well aware of, for which I take a little credit since the germ of the idea emerged from a proposal uh, which I spearheaded when serving on NACI, the National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, three years ago, um, has been a vote of confidence in the idea uh, and in many ways caused some concern for us and grantees and agencies alike. I should mention the work done here by John Williams of the SBA and Nagesh Rao also of the SBA in spearheading the notion of commercialization and the funding that goes with it. I believe it is positive that we have recognized the importance of commercialization and have provided funding to enable commercialization to be more than just a footnote in the SBR, STTR grantees world. However, as I said, one size does not fit all. It would be a mistake to make the in, this an individual handout program and would be a great step forward to recognize that an ecosystem services concept, reducing, not, uh, not, uh, reducing risk, increasing viability, visibility, and credibility by deploying the curated experience and wisdom of a marketplace is an approach that fits the profile of our times. What does this mean? For you, uh, for your consideration, it means enabling a hybrid approach. Let agencies um, solicit and have accountable to them and the SBR, STTR companies, GSA vetted contractors like ourselves, providing ecosystem services. And also allow companies to choose their own vendor if they demonstrate that they know what they know and can afford the risk. Most research-based companies, however, in our experience, do not necessarily know at the beginning, in particular, what they don't know. And this is not surprising, and it's not a reflection of any condescension on my part. We have tracked, surveyed, and brought into our network thousands of companies, and it is clear from our work that this is a true reflection of the reality of research-based businesses. In addition, the government itself, as a user and buyer of products and services of the kind that, uh, that Dr. Brown mentioned here, uh, created by SPR companies, it's itself, I don't think, not especially well tuned to the prospect of energizing such products paid for by the US taxpayer, except arguably in the Department of Defense, and I say arguably because you heard from Dr. Brown. In summary, one size does not fit all. Commercialization is an ever-expanding journey, not a destination. It, if you, you should recognize the importance of ecosystem or hub services and providers who have been successful in curating and providing these services as vital to the future of the SBR program. This is informed choice, and the government should consider how it might prime the pump on phase three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sade, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Crow, Ranking Member Balderson, members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. As you mentioned, I previously served as associate administrator, which ran, among others, the programs being discussed here today. Some of the companies, out of the hundreds of thousands that received some of these grants and investments include Apple, Qualcomm, Tesla, and Genentech. But my focus here today is on the SBA Accelerator Fund, Growth Accelerator Fund competition. It was launched under my watch in 2014. The program's genesis is rooted in Obama's first term when the economy was in a free fall. One of the things it uh, focused was a more inclusive and accessible economy, which it should be, continue, part, uh, continue to be a, a, a big part of the economic agenda. The economy turned around, and the economic indicators are strong, but, it, but, the, gener but the prosperity generated has been uneven. It is now more uneven than before the 08 crisis. Tens of millions of people have been left behind most of them are from underrepresented groups, hard to upskill workers, and rural communities. This dynamic is magnified in our innovation economy. Venture capital's persistent geographic gender and racial homogeneity, evolving business formation pathways, and the lack of diversity in private and public company C-suites and boards affect this dynamic. 
and affect the productive capacity and growth potential of our economy. The government's role investing in the building blocks of innovation, empowering innovators, and clearing a path for anyone with talent cannot be overstated. Our innovation ecosystem, as you've all mentioned, is one of our country's crown jewels. But other countries are catching up fast. China is probably the best example. And the digital divide in the US continues to get wider. More pathways enhance the ability to scale participation in the economy, but they continue to be sporadically reachable. The, fund the Growth Accelerator Fund competition is one of these pathways. The fact that diversity in any form continues to be part of the conversations is good and bad. Good, because we're talking about it. Bad, because we're talking about it. The competition had two goals, which it accomplished. One, leveling the playing fields in, area, in geographic areas with less access to the traditional sources of capital. And two, supporting ecosystems and companies owned by, managed by, or that support underserved groups like veterans, people with disabilities, and minorities. The competition is now in its fifth year, and with relatively little money, as mentioned before, it has supported more than 200 entrepreneurial ecosystems in 45 states, DC, and Puerto Rico. They, in turn, support thousands of startups and entrepreneurs in places like Anchorage, Little Rock, Shreveport, Harrisburg, Detroit, and San Juan. You mentioned a few of the statistics, uh, and the program has been very successful in reaching underserved groups. 21% of the winners had startups that were owned by or led by American Indians, Alaskan Natives, or Native Hawaiians. 18% led by individuals with disabilities. 70% with those with limited access to capital. 80% who were racial minorities. 42% led by veterans. And 90%, 90% had startups owned or led by women. The program can certainly be improved, but the data points to the accelerator competition being a successful component of the American entrepreneurial ecosystem. At a high level, some things that Congress and the agency should think about. One, is establish more permanent support and policy from a funding and policy perspective. Two, enhance the pathways for the thousands of startups that graduate to access the SBIR and STTR programs. Three, improve coordination with your districts and all the others uh, around the country. States and cities are very important. Three, enforce tighter administration of the program with more robust reporting and metrics. Three, uh, whatever number I'm on, sorry. Um, examine intra-agency <laughs> overlap with other entrepreneurial support programs. Uh, improve and continue underrepresented group and geographic gap outreach. And think about having different levels of award sizes. I'm happy to answer any questions about this or the other programs. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Sade uh, and Mr. Schroeder. Despite the fact that, uh, like my friend and colleague, Mr. Balderson, I'm sure you are a Buckeyes fan. You are recognized for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Crow, Representative Balderson. It's an honor to speak to the committee today on such an important aspect as innovative research. <clears throat> excuse me, especially with FTI's long history in the program. And as most of you know, the program started in 1977 under the National Science Foundation. It didn't take long for the SBA to figure out how important a program it was, and it culminated with President Reagan signing it into law in 1982. Since that time, there's been tremendous numbers of economic studies that have occurred on the program. When you look at those, what you can clearly see is, well, the money extremely well spent, something that we can all be proud of. In this particular case, there's aspects like the National Cancer Institute that talk about the return from taxes is a three to one ratio. There's hundreds of thousands of jobs in just that study alone that are very high paying good jobs. Uh, the, the revenue generated by companies are 10 times that. My background with the Defense Department is a little bit more associated with some of those studies as well. And as you know, there are programs out there like just the Joint Strike Fighter Program has published reports that said the SBIR technologies have saved a half a billion dollars on just one program within the Defense Department. It's something that we can all be proud of, while they also publish the fact that there's a 12 to 1, a 19 to 1, and a 23 to 1 ratio. I sit here and smile when I think of what Congress has done, because effectively, you have become the shark tank of the government long before the program was popular. You took the risk to invest in the technologies, and as small businesses, we thank you for that very, very much. 
The key is to understand what the technology and the program does. And realistically, a lot of people in the community will focus on the funding, the phase ones and phase twos. But let me tell you as a small business, what that does for you is it allows you to have a few people to work on a concept and a prototype in hopes that ultimately you can commercialize it. The real program success is in the phase threes. That's where the jobs are. That's when customers can acquire as much as they want with any kind of funding that they want. It's jobs, jobs, and more jobs. And that's where our companies, our employees, the families of those employees, that's where the growth comes from and that's what we very much appreciate. And realistically, while the program has been in place for 37 years, it's this committee and what it's done to evolve the program over the years that is so critical. Because the subtle changes of allowing a company to grow beyond the, the 500 limit when you're going into the phase three and producing more jobs was critical to the program's success. But it wasn't just that, the recent addition of the 3% administration fee to allow the government people that we interact with to come to us and actually work on it is equally critical. You can look at a variety of those aspects. Um, the most recent guidance from the SBA talking about use the phase three program to the maximum extent possible is critical for companies like FTI because when we go to the government and talk about here's the technology, you agree that it might be valuable and you can use it, they need to see from you and from the SBA and from the DOD that it's allowed, that they don't have to be scared, that they can take it and run. So again, from our perspective, we thank you for subtle changes throughout the decades. It's very, very critical to us, which then leads us to, so what's next? And I think there, there will continue to be subtle changes as this program goes on. Those of us that are in the battle of it can give you some suggestions. I think they got to come from your heart. I will tell you, after 37 years, I still don't understand why the program's not permanent. It's something that it's in every phone that we have today. It's across the examples you gave. I really do think it's time to make the program permanent. And I, I realize that some will hesitate because they'll worry about the ability to monitor it. I think there's ways you can build into the law that you can consistently check on it. If you do look at considering it to be a permanent program, I think what you put into that law is critical as well because things like um, rapid innovation funding, which is the key starter to get those new customers over that risk aspect since you've only built a prototype. Um, the 3% administration fee to allow the government to actually help you run the program. All of those things are critical to the success of any permanent program that you look at, as well as even who's in the program. You know, American-based technology companies that can take these things and run are critical. So mostly, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity today, for the changes that you have done over the years, and for the courage to look at the program in the future. Be happy to answer any questions as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. We appreciate the testimony that all of you uh, shared today. And I would like to now submit this letter from the Clean Energy Business Network for the record uh, without objection. So ordered. <clears throat> I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, this is a, a question for uh, all of the witnesses. You know, in my opening statement, I talked about this, uh, this concept of the valley of death that um, you know, many businesses in my community, my district, have talked about. So uh, I'd, I'd love to hear briefly from each of you whether that's an idea, concept, or term that you've heard of, uh, where that e exists in kind of the, the pipeline of the development of your businesses, and what we can do to help uh, close that uh, to make sure that we're setting folks up for success long term. And maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Crow, the valley of death is, is real. Um, it, and it's not just into phase three. I mean, we go into valleys every time between phase one and phase two. I mean, that's what's so revolutionary about what the Air Force is doing with their pitch days, is they are rapidly moving us through the process. We already have phase three commitments now from, from Air Force partners that want to see our technology move forward. And what's different there is we're being given access. Before the SBIR program, we were working for the research institutes. Now they traditionally don't move technology fast through the process. They're there for the long-term vision. But what we need to really move the innovative ecosystem into the hands of the warfighters is technologies that can move fast. 
that can get in front of the decision makers, can show them, we're not asking for a handout. We just want the opportunity to be able to walk in and show them what we can deliver. And that's what the SBIR program has done. Other programs that have been started to get innovation into the hands of the water warfighter, we don't see as having nearly the opportunity to be as successful as the SBIR. Um, Congress basically, you know, they asked for rapid prototypes to be enacted. They gave the DOD acquisition authority to do other transaction authorities. You go look at those programs, they're almost, they're, they're major, the vast majority of them are giving awards to the large businesses, not to the small innovators, not to the non-traditional contractors, but to the same companies that are, in fact, the foundation of our Department of Defense. I mean, they're a national asset as well. But they, it sounds uh, like it, it sounds like speed is a really essential element here. That the process is taking long, and one of the unique aspects of the pitch day uh, is that it expedites it fairly significantly. And so, would you say that um, there, there's an opportunity to scale this and roll it out to other services, and that would be helpful? Absolutely. And I'd I'd also say it's the, it's the speed and the access. It's getting us in front of the decision makers so they can make the decision of, of what we can do to help them. Thank you, Mr. Shukla. Yes, sir. Of course, we've heard of the valley of death, but I also think there is a consideration given to the chasm of relevance. Uh, making yourself relevant to a set of buyers and potential users is what should be encouraged. Uh, I do believe that credibility, reduction of risk, visibility, viability are all issues for small businesses in the research phases of their programs, including phase one and phase two. One of the things we've done is to reduce that risk, increase the visibility and viability of these companies, increase their credibility by putting ourselves on the line, essentially, in front of buyers and, and investors and so on and so forth. It's a proxy of what Dr. Brown talked about in the, in the Defense Department, getting them before people who might be interested in taking these on. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a range of different things that can be done and should be done. It's a highly dynamic kind of process trying to engage a marketplace where there's a tremendous amount of competition. I will say, and Javier might back me up on this, the landscape of funding has also changed dramatically. It's no longer just about venture capital. And it's no longer just about corporate capital either, corporate investment capital. Foundations are now inv investing in, in, in companies. Family offices have become really active. These are all channels that you have to keep juggling with and working with, and we do that on behalf of these small businesses, because their success is our success. Thank, We're thank able you, to and I want to give the others an opportunity as well. Thank you. Mr. Sade? Yeah, I, I don't have uh, much to add. I'll say that the, it is the 21st century and the way in which business formation happens, capital formation happens, how people access technologies. Um, has changed and along with that is concentration of said capital and the path of least resistance typically is to write big checks. But the value of death affects the smaller entities which need smaller checks. So there's all kinds of issues there and yes. I smile when you said that because it is the history of our company. I, I have a book in my office that I ask others to read called Crossing the Chasm. And the chasm is crossing that valley of death. It is so critical. And it's really why I tell some of our employees that FTI is blessed to have been a company that took 30 years to become an overnight success. And ultimately what happens is we were blessed to have multiple phase ones and phase twos on the same topic. When you come after your first one, you've got one researcher that loves what you're doing, but to take it to Joint Strike Fighter or other people, they're not quite sure it's there, i.e. your valley of death. But when you can take that opportunity and maybe get another phase one or a phase two associated with it, or you spend some of your own resources associated with it, you're, I'm sorry, in my words, crossing that chasm, and yours going over the valley of death, and it takes a little while to get over that valley which is why the joke but truth of decades to become an overnight success. Because once you hit that momentum, now all of a sudden people realize it's not something you've done for one person, but not one researcher that was intrigued by the technology, but now you've got five or six or 10 that enjoy it, and their ability to now trust that their dollars are gonna give them something that's worthwhile is much easier for them to tolerate. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. The ranking member, Mr. Balderson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Crow. Um, Mr. Schroeder, uh, while the SBIR has proven beneficial to early stage growth, 
The process itself can make it hard to develop products because of delays. Can you offer any recommendation as to how to alleviate some of the pinch points that people face? I, I really think it, it's a, a corporate culture that has to be evolved. I, I think you have to look at it as you're on Shark Tank. And when you're on Shark Tank, I think it's we're honored to have your funding. And while this topic of the SBIR might be a particular focus, we as a company have to make sure that we're spending the money in a way that you would be proud. And that proud doesn't include just looking at the technology today, but sending those, spending those resources to productize the technology in a way that goes beyond the two or four or six people that you're talking to originally. And so it's challenging as research engineers, et cetera, to literally take the scope of what might have originally been defined in a topic of an SBIR phase one or whatever and think that to commercialize it, we're going to have to expand that scope and when we expand that scope, it's going to broaden us to other customers, and those customers will be able to use that product maybe in a slightly different manner than what it was originally envisioned to be. But I, I give you the equivalent of if, you, if we were Microsoft and we were all using Microsoft Word at some point in time, what's going to happen is if you want a better spell checker, how would you like to be the only organization that pays for that change? That doesn't work. What you have to do is diversify that in, in increase in capability across a broader audience, and you need to have that focus when you start the phase one and phase two SBIR. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Dr. Brown, uh, according to the Census Bureau, female-owned firms account for 36% of all American businesses, and that number is steadily rising, which is a good thing. Can you offer any advice to female entrepreneurs who may be interested in applying to the SBIR program? Um, one advice I, I'd like to give them is, a, is, a, is basically a real-world story related to a friend of mine who's also a, small, who's also a woman on small business. It is an unfortunate fact of life that women in the defense industry face discrimination. And there have been cases where women have been permitted to be part of the 8A program. The 8A program has significantly more access to opportunities for businesses than the women-owned small business program, significantly. So my friend had faced significant discrimination. She went through, quite frankly, a humiliating experience, which I have elected never to do myself. And she put forward her experiences to the ATA and applied to become a member of that program. Other women have been successful in going through that process. She was denied, not because she hadn't experienced discrimination, she was denied by the SBA because she had persevered and succeeded in spite of that. Now, no other member of the ATA program is required to go, first of all, through that humiliating experience. And secondly, would be judged ineligible for that program just because of the fact that they had actually succeeded. So I would ask that you consider giving women-owned small businesses the same blanket protection that other minorities. We are not a minority, but we are definitely a minority in small businesses and in government contracting. Please give us the same protection as other 8A programs and do not require us to go through this humiliating process even though we have suffered, in many cases, more than other minorities. Thank you very much, and we'll help any way we can. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, we're pretty close to being out of time, so I will yield back my remaining time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to recognize the uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania, uh, Ms. Houlihan, for five minutes. Wow, I wish I had been here to hear what you were just talking about. Uh, I'm grateful to you all for your uh, testimony and for coming here. We actually have a lot in common. I was a program manager in the Air Force. I'm also an MIT person. My mom's a GPS person, uh, and I'm an entrepreneur and small business owner myself. And so a lot of what you guys talk about really resonates with me. And so some of my questions have to do with um, 
training of workforce development. Uh, and so one of the things I've heard is consistently that we don't have a, for small businesses, a really good pipeline of STEM trained uh, workforce. I think that people who are from larger and more established businesses don't have quite the same pipeline problem. And so I've had the chance to try and travel within my community. I'm from Philadelphia area uh, to find programs that are trying to elevate uh, people into that pathway. Uh, specifically, one of them was in the University City Science Center in Philadelphia. And I was wondering how we as a federal government can help you all in this particularly uh, this particular issue, if you could talk about that. Um, thank you so much for bringing that up. STEM is actually a passion of mine. I volunteer extensively, both with the local universities, um, mentoring um, girls as young as 12. I mean, it's been shown that we have to basically get young people excited about technology and moving into our industries at that age. And girls in particular are very disadvantaged in being able to, to have role models and so forth to move forward to. Um, I'd like to circle back on the SBR program and just give you some real world stories. Um, when, I, when I first moved to Colorado, you know, my, my main office is actually in Monument, which is not far from your district. And at that time, that was a very sleepy little town. It's grown a lot since then, but it was very sleepy. One, I got involved with the local high school, and one of my early employees was actually a high school student, Randy Silver. He went through, um, we sponsored him, he went through uh, University of Colorado, we, we actually gave him scholarships and so forth. He came back and worked for us and was an absolute star. I'm happy to say we've continued that model. Um, I have a high school student from Salida High School now. We started a field office there. This is a very small rural mountain town. You know, we have a very, we, we quite frankly are very disadvantaged in our local high school in terms of access, broadband access in particular. So what, I, what he, this, this student is just amazing. We've got him working on new technologies related to position, navigation technology, deep learning, and we're soon going to start developing some new game technology. Mm -hmm. He is just lapping it up. And other students there have similar abilities, and when they're given access to the broadband, they're given access to mentors. They're given access to the online courses. He's doing an online university course right now. Um, that is revolutionary, and I'd like to thank you for the SPR program because it's enabled companies like mine to bring on and encourage these mm -hmm, youth. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, anyone else? Thank you, ma'am. I just wanted to say um, there are lots of imaginative approaches to workforce development in particular going on around the country. I, I think you will hear from industry generally across the board in innovation and technology that there is a real concern with the preparedness of the workforce and the availability of talent. And clearly, one of the responses has been to import talent using, obviously, the conventional method of doing so over the years, which, of course, has come under considerable stress, as you know, more recently. Uh, I will say the one thing you can do as a, as, as, as a government is to actually f focus on integrating the different efforts in workforce development across the agencies. So labor has a whole bunch of stuff. EDA at the Department of Commerce has a whole range of programs. I think if you start to look at them and see where the common elements of training and gra block grants, for example, for education and training to the states and to local uh, programs at the community colleges, you will find that they're that you'll, you'll, you'll reduce duplication, reduce the silos between programs, focus on a particular objective of being able to get a well-trained workforce for different kinds of new jobs, and not just technical jobs, but jobs that can actually work on critical thinking across the board. Uh, you don't see that very often. You don't see that kind of coordination. In fact, it's been going on now for 25, 30 years that I've seen starting in the Clinton administration and moving all the way down. No, I appreciate that, and I'm, you know, I'm a freshman here, and in my first eight months, what I have seen is definite silos, you know, whether it's uh, programs that help women, you know, entrepreneurs, or programs that help veteran entrepreneurs, I'm both, you know, and so when I ask questions about the intersectionality of those, there's a kind of crickets, and so I think that, I think that's a really good point. I have only seven seconds left, so I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Now I will recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, uh, for holding this important hearing. As all of you know and exemplify, small business owners have to be innovative and willing to take some risk. It's what defines American entrepreneurs and defines all of y'all. 
I was happy to help introduce the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Improvement Act, and I'll require each of you to re restate that name to me as you leave today. That's a joke, by the way. Let's make sure y'all are listening over there. Um, and along with my colleagues, including Mr. Baird and Chairman Crow, I feel this legislation will help provide some competitive funding opportunities that encourage small businesses to take risks and pursue innovative research for technology commercialization and, and frankly, do what y'all do best. Um, this is a question for Mr. Schroeder. Can you talk a little bit about, and if any of the others want to add in after him, that'd be great about how the SBIR program allows companies to take risks on technologies they believe in but might not have the financial wherewithal to work on it. It really is, you know, I go back to the Shark Tank aspect. Um, we're fortunate to have resource dollars associated with it that we can take the risk of hiring those STEM people into engineering and scientific aspects and, and not be afraid of failing on a technological approach. Uh, we look at failure on a technology basis as just an opportunity to learn what doesn't work so that we can move to the next aspect. When you're doing that on a uh, Defen Department of Defense funding aspect, that's very challenging. You don't want to use their money in a way that is hesitant or that they would be disappointed by. But when you're doing that with an SBIR program and the SBI do dollars, as long as you learn from that and adapt your technology to deal with those, under that aspect, you are really given an opportunity to succeed. And once you get past those, I'll call them the valleys, the challenges, the technological um, breakpoints, and you adapt, I think you then have a much stronger technology that hopefully you can ripple throughout the rest of the uh, organization. So for us, the SBIR program is unlike any other aspect that we've dealt with. It gives you the opportunity to take the risk, fail until you succeed. Um, I, I work in both an advisory capacity for the Department of Defense, you know, through my Air Force Science Advisory Board work as well as a small business. So one of the things I see that is so important in technology today and be, bringing it forward in innovation is, is the willingness to fail fast and learn from your failures. And if you don't take risks, you don't get the great advance, advances. So for example, um, Iridium, wonderful system, you know, the first global low Earth orbiting communication system. It's, it's been dramatic and changing lives all over the world. It was developed here in America. And it was developed with a lot of sponsorship from the Department of Defense. But one of the biggest items that would never have been built as a DOD system. And the reason is, is because they took the risk to fly all of their satellites with non-space qualified parts. Space qualification adds a decade into the legacy of technology introduction into military satellites. They're, we're still working with technology that uh, you know, was developed 10 years ago and now is hardened and tested that is considered safe to use in satellites. Iridium took a totally different approach. The, the graybeards, as it were, in the defense industry thought it wasn't going to work. It did work. If they hadn't been able to take that risk, afford to basically try it, work around it, develop solutions, we wouldn't have that system today. And we wouldn't be looking at this huge explosion in broadband satellite internet that's all going to be based on commercial technology that's coming from the, the other companies following them. Uh, to piggyback on that, is there any um, opportunities to advance on others' failures? I, I'm, I'm a gearhead, and I'm, I'm follow, I, I like the history of Ferrari. And Mr. Ferrari actually never built a car. He just built a wonderful 12-cylinder engine and, um, and had other people build his bodies, but he watched as other race cars would would end up crashing, and then uh, he would find out what they did and then innovate on it, and so he didn't have those same um, catastrophes. I certainly think there's a lot of that. We, we talk about, in our case, I, you know, maybe he talked to people and figured out his bodies and the cars weren't the best, but we oftentimes use the concept of we have two ears and one mouth. Sometimes we have to use them in that proportion. The key is listening to what the customers need and then adapting. And when you start off, to be fair, when you think you understand, uh, let's take a phase one SBIR topic, um, it's a one-page description. For you to imply that you truly understand what they think is the problem is at best a little speculative. So the most important thing you can do in a phase one or phase two program is just to sit down and listen. 
and, and describe to them what you think you've heard them say. Let them get a, a chance to reiterate it. Go talk to others that are similar to them so that you end up finding out more and more about the, what the real problem is, which is way more valuable than the actual topics and the descriptions that come out of the system. So if I just might uh, add one little thing. Uh, I know they're talking about uh, the Department of Defense, in particular military procurement. In the civilian agency world, in the SBIR world, risk is baked into the process itself, as they both uh, alluded to and Javier alluded to as well. One of the things we do is to ensure that we maintain continuing intelligence about the marketplace that we can share with additional folks coming into the program, cohorts that we're training. That's extremely important because it's experiential learning that we're able to impart to grantees that they otherwise would not on their own be able to access. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. I've gone over. I appreciate right. your indulgence, brother. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to now uh, recognize the gentle lady from Iowa, Ms. Finkenauer. Thank you, Chairman Crow. Um, the topic of today's hearing means a heck of a lot to me. You know, I came to Congress to help Iowa small businesses fuel innovation and create jobs, but more importantly, the underlying part of that is I grew up in a state where I started seeing a lot of my friends that I graduated high school with move away. And we've got to figure out ways to create more opportunity in rural areas, bring people back home, and also make sure that they can stay and find opportunity. And so one of the first things I tackled uh, was making sure that the Small Business Innovation Research Program and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program were more accessible uh, because I found that that was a great vehicle to be able to do it. You know, I was actually sworn in um, with uh, Chairman Crow on January 3rd. And by January 14th, I was really proud to get to pass my first piece of legislation, the Small Business uh, Innovation uh, Procurement Act, or through Procurement Act of 2019, along with um, my uh, colleague that I met right across the hallway from me in Canon, um, Congressman Curtis. It was a bipartisan bill, one that I knew was incredibly important, again, for our state and for communities all across the country. And, um, you know, the Small Business Innovation Research Program and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program have truly put innovative small firms on the map. Uh, these programs have given our small businesses the opportunity to participate in federal research and development and commercialize their work. Uh, this is a win, obviously, for small businesses and for economic innovation and growth, again, all across our country. However, more small businesses could be benefiting from these programs. Uh, my bill actually requires government personnel to conduct outreach to small firms on the Small Business Innovation Research Program and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, specifically HR 246, um, obviously the bill that I've been talking about that we were able to pass, stimulating Innovation through Procurement Act of 2019, um, it would add a duty to the role of the procurement center uh, to uh, at the SBA to actually assist small firms with these programs. You know, I'm proud of this work. It was one again that just made sense and uh, something that we needed to get done again to help the next generation. And we've done our work here in the House to get this thing done and passed. Um, but I'll keep pushing every day for it to become law, um, Mr. Shukla. Um, if this bill is signed into law, how would HR 246 help? stimulate small business innovation in places like Iowa? What would that mean for rural areas? Thank you very much, yeah. uh, uh, Ms. Fecht. Now, uh, I will say, uh, since I have also worked in, in Iowa, by the way, oh my goodness. Uh, involving food and ag and yes. life sciences, in particular two anchors of the state's economy, uh, and in rural Iowa, I will say that you're absolutely on the right track. The one thing I, I would ask, though, is for you folks to empower the SBA with funding and staffing. Yes. They are absolutely. really understaffed. Absolutely. And to connect in the conventional funding apparatus of SBA, which is lending, uh, in particular, with the innovation arm, which is really, really, really underfunded in terms of staffing. Uh, if you want to be able to increase the output of innovation in rural areas, you've got to be able to expand the scope of what they currently do. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. They do some great things with the road tour, the road show, and the road tour mm-hmm. to underserved areas and to rural areas. But I think it should be expanded beyond that for outreach and training and procurement and a whole range of things that need to be brought together. So if this bill were to get signed into law and these procurement officers um, were made to then work with some of our small businesses uh, to, to get those government contracts, what would that mean specifically? Well, it would certainly mean that you could have, like you do right now with the SBIR program, in any case, to set aside for small business, is to establish a core group that you can actually reach out to in rural areas. Uh, USDA does a program on rural development, uh, but it's frankly underserved, in my opinion. Uh, So I think you could do some things in rural parts of the the U.S. The broadband initiative is one of them uh, that could be linked directly to the SBIR program itself for topic areas and so on. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for explaining that to folks in the committee and to Washington. And I just also just want to take the opportunity to just thank you all for coming um, to testify here today. It does mean a lot. And um, we've got some good work to do and I'm excited to get to do it. And thank you again, um, Chairman Crow. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. I, I just have one follow up question. Uh, the district that I represent, represent is one of the, the most diverse districts in the country. I have over 150 languages spoken uh, in uh, one of my cities. Almost one out of every five residents was born outside of the country. And there are very unique challenges uh, to our immigrants and refugee communities in starting and growing businesses and accessing these programs. Uh, so I, know, uh, I would love your thoughts on, uh, you know, just very briefly on what uh, your experience has been on those challenges and what we could be doing better to make sure that we're reducing barriers and opening this up for uh, uh, those communities. Mr. Mr. Uh, Sade, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll give it a try. Look, um, the pathways to economic prosperity uh, have widened. Uh, but the people that control the purse strings, and I'm not talking about necessarily where we sit today, but in the private sector, um, have concentrated. So um, uh, it's not only immigrant communities, but anyone that, if you look at the, the general macros of the demographics of the population, something like 30% of the population is white males. And I don't have anything against white males, but the reality is that the country is not white male uh and if you if you believe that talent is equally distributed yet opportunity is not then a good place to focus is not necessarily on the raw ingredients of what takes a technology to a company to the capital markets and to eventually millions of pensioners holding the stock of a publicly traded company, but just giving the people in, to the door. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, without these programs, 70% of the technologies in the Apple phone would not exist. A drug that saved my dad, Retoxin, Biogen, would not exist without SBIR. So there's just the fact that they exist is an amazing thing. But the country is changing. The world is changing. The countries are with knives in their mouths, trying to take us off the pedestal across many aspects, including economic diplomacy or entrepreneurial diplomacy. Um, so yes, I agree with you that, uh, that a focus on less served groups, and that includes immigrants, um, is smart business. On top of the fact that, one last thing, if you look at the market, uh, at the biggest uh, companies in the United States by market cap, 40% of them were starting by first generation immigrants. So all the money that Wall Street loves and all the stocks we love to buy, and it's literally the lifeblood of, and I don't want this to be an immigration, uh, <laughs> an immigration pitch, but it, immigrants are hugely important to the innovation economy. Thank you, Mr. Sade. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses for sharing your time. And um, oh, okay. uh, Representative Kim, one of our colleagues, uh, is uh, on his way right now and had a, a question he wanted to ask. So uh, I would open it up to uh, Mr. Shukla or Ms. Brown or Mr. Schroeder if you have any comments on my last question. Yes, sir. Um, you know, in 1986, Margaret Thatcher turned to Gorbachev and said, Mr. General Secretary, the ice is most difficult when it's breaking up. 
the fact of the matter is things are in flux, and they are in flux. And what Javier was talking about in terms of immigrants leading economic development in certain areas is true. And access is also becoming a big issue. Now, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we're actually finding ways of being able to deal with this issue. Obviously, there's some real concerns at a national level and federal level, but at a state level, states of Cal like California, for example, are very diverse, as you know. I come from one of the most diverse cities on the planet, uh, and it, it also has extreme inequality, but there's lots of things that are being done to address different aspects of it, and I'm very optimistic. That's all I would have to like to tell you. Um, thank you for asking the question. As you've heard, of course, I'm an immigrant. You know, I was sworn in in front of the Capitol, st the steps of Colorado, as a result of uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, Immigrants' Day. It's a day that I always remember. Um, one of the things that I think would be most appropriate to try and help your, your diverse constituents is better and equal access to capital. W immigrants have great ideas. But when you go into a bank and you're looking for a loan and you're trying to get approval, you, you just have to look at the numbers to see that women, immigrants, are disadvantaged in that domain. The SBA has some fantastic programs. They've had programs, too, that really try and improve rural access to capital, which is even more disadvantaged. So I would encourage, look at the numbers. If the numbers are not showing that we're spreading access to capital equally, Look at how do you fix that, because you can't you can't make a business without getting a bank loan. Yeah. Mr. Schroeder, I, I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer that question, but I will tell you, um, as you think through it, if it's more of a discussion, stay focused on the phase three for just a second, because you can enter through the immigration. It's, it's a little bit hard for uh, my background because. From an immigration perspective, it might be hard to get Defense Department clearances to do the classified work. So while um, being a Caucasian male and having a company uh, proud of, et cetera, we have been able to hire a lot of people. Um, we've grown from two states to I think we're in 26 states now across the board. Um, so we'd like to think that it's spread out at least more geographic. But as you think of the program in the future, whether it's capital and other things, I think you've got to find that balancing act of when you're actually doing it to generate the start of a new program versus actually the hiring of those immigrants. I know we have hired significantly in Colorado recently. Um, to us, immigrants are fine as long as they can work in that environment and have been an important part of growth for us. Um, but you can understand the challenge of clearances and other things that might be associated with Defense Department programs. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize um, the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Mr. Kim, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you so much for coming here and, and talking with our committee. I was rushing over here from uh, uh, the Conference Committee for the National Defense Authorization Act, where we talked a lot about the importance of, of innovation in our system as well, uh, in our national security, certainly in our energy sector, and so many other important uh, components. Um, so I just, uh, coming straight out of there, I wanted to rush on over here and just uh, really just kind of get a sense from you of, of some of the steps that we can take. You know, I know that, you know, SBIR, uh, STTR, and, and some of these other programs, they play an important role in terms of spurring the technological innovation. Um, and these programs like these that have allowed the United States to not only create a sustainable <laughs> workforce, but also to become uh, the leader in tech innovation despite strong global uh, competition. Um, as I said, you know, this is particularly the case in clean energy and a number of the places where I think uh, this overlaps with a lot of interest, certainly in my own district, as we're thinking about the future role that we can play in that innovation. Uh, so I just wanted to start, uh, Mr. Shukla, uh, you have advised uh, multiple nations on technology-led innovation. Um, what kind of investments should the United States government make to remain competitive in innovation on a global scale, especially in sectors like clean energy? So I, th I do think that there are uh, incredible investments that have been made by this country in centers of excellence across the, uh, across the United States in universities, uh, in cities, in clean tech uh, foundation funds, in the competitions that exist around clean tech. Uh, the one concern is there is considerably less 
coordination than there ought to be. And so when you have funding that comes down different silos, either federal or state, there really is no coordinated effort to say, what are we trying to achieve? What are the success factors that we're looking at? What kinds of jobs are we likely to be able to get from this? Where else can we prime the pump to make sure that we have those kinds of investments that yield results and monitor them? Uh, it's easier when you have a smaller economy. I mean, Germany decided, you know, we're going to go specifically into solar uh, production and solar technology and solar energy and all of the aspects of it that matter, only to then be bested by China. So when you have countries that don't play by the rules, even though they're supposed to play by the rules because they've been inducted in, you have to be particularly careful about this. And it's, it's a cautionary tale only because this has happened in food and ag, it's happened in the life sciences, it's happened in materials, and it's happened now in clean tech and clean energy. Uh, so I think we've got to really focus on what is our national goal in particular, and then make sure that we coordinate across every single agency and also every single state which has programs in this regard. The federal government almost leaves this aside and says, you know, that's up to you guys to do this. Under our federal system, that might make sense, but I don't think as a national objective, it makes sense to be able to leave things to the wind, so to speak. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate this. Um, uh, Mr. Saadi, I wanted to just uh, seek your thoughts on, on something in particular. Um, so for five years, the SBA has funded the Growth Accelerator Fund competition, uh, which awards monetary prizes of $50,000 to nations, uh, most promising small business accelerators and incubators. Now, 60% of the funding is steered to support entrepreneurs in one of the following groups, women, uh, socially and economically disadvantaged uh, opportunity zones or uh, those located in states underrepresented by SBIR, SDTR. Um, can you please speak to the value of the program in providing support to traditionally underserved groups? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, you, can, you can think about it as, as financial services or banking, but just to take it down uh, uh, a notch to the innovation economy is venture capital and the entrepreneurial activity it funds is concentrated in basically five states. And in those five states, it's six cities. And those cities are magnets for people. Uh, they're magnets for the tax revenue they generate. Uh, it is very difficult to compete with those. The fine congresswoman from Iowa was uh, talking about it from her perspective, Iowa. Um, and it cannot be uh, overstated that discovery can happen anywhere, but typically what happens is that one of these technologies or one of these companies gets discovered and a venture capitalist from Menlo Park or Brooklyn invest in them. They basically uproot the seed and move them to Menlo Park. So the reason for that is because those places are ecosystems by design and they have been around for years. No one is gonna ever replicate Silicon Valley again for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of ingredients that made that happen. But the reality is that there's a lot of cities and places in America, Boulder, Austin, suburbs of Seattle that are not trying to be Silicon Valley but are trying to combine all those ingredients that make an entrepreneurial ecosystem important. This program essentially anchors the ecosystem literally by building and supporting ecosystems. And the hypothesis was pretty simple, is that by creating, by creating the ability for serendipitous collisions to happen and, uh, and a focus of attention for different communities, including in your state, Mr. Kim, um, that you will support a more entrepreneurial economy. And it's been shown that places with more entrepreneurial, more entrepreneurial energy and more business formation actually have better economies. So the program, sort of like SBIR and SDTR, functions as kind of like first risk because no one else in the private sector will ever take the risk because it's a 30-year runway for a national priority. Um, there's no one in the private sector that's going to take a risk on Shreveport or my hometown of San Juan. So the government's role with just that little bit of money is to help catalyze some of those, uh, some of those things. And um, one more thing I'll add is that $50,000 in the great scheme of things is 
the salary of a person with a college degree, yeah. generally. Um, not much. But the idea around the ecosystem is that it attracts private capital. And that the program has been pretty successful uh, in doing. Uh, um, and Congress, I think, has a match uh, requirement on some of the dollars that go into accelerators. So it's a, you know, it's a low risk and low dollar way to kind of open the aperture for for opportunity. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. I, I yield back. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all the witnesses for your time, sharing your expertise and experiences. This is very valuable for us as we look at all the legislation and the fixes and things that need to happen to make sure that we're remaining competitive. competitive. Um, increasing our competitive, competitiveness by supporting small business innovation is more critical than ever, as we heard about today. As our world continues to become increasingly connected, America's lead in technology is crucial to our economic prosperity and national security. The partnership between federally funded research, academia, and private industry has been pivotal to U.S. technological advancement since the 1930s and has helped the U.S. maintain leadership despite stagnating investments. However, that lead is rapidly evaporating. That is why investment and in improved access to these programs and the Growth Accelerator Fund competition must continue to grow and succeed. The members of this committee must continue to raise awareness of the value of these programs and lead on developing policies to ensure their success. I look forward to working with Ranking Member Balderson so that small businesses in the U.S. have the tools they need to innovate, grow, and create jobs on main streets all around the country. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered. If there's no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you.